to show you this um, a couple of months ago I brought my friend down here to the cuckoo trail which is where I am at the moment with Neddy and um, his dog wanted to roll in something which was turned out for a dead grass snake anyway here is the skeleton of oh sorry dog scratching of that grass snake. Isn't it amazing? So we talked about smile paths. This is something called a desire path. Not sure how well you can see that. But basically this is the main path that I'm walking along. It's not showing up terribly well. There's Ned eating poo. And then just off up here is a desire path which leads through to a little gap by that oak tree there and that's basically so a desire path there's a, there's a path that runs across the top of the field here and so a desire path is basically a path which joins up two places in you know the the most desirable way so that's a desire path just seen another little um, bird's nest obviously it's um, one of last year's it's just set back in this hedgerow this is quite badly flooded you can see where all the grass and where all the debris is so this flooded quite a lot when we had the big rains a few weeks ago This is grown out coppice, so basically just kind of um, you've got the oak oak standards there, and then you've got all this hazel coppice and the odd birch, silver birch up through there. But this is absolutely carpeted with bluebells in the spring. This tree has split down the middle and um, the sort of shelf left behind has become its own little ecosystem in itself. You can see there's lots of nuts that have been chewed by mice. Lots of little flowers that are enjoying the, or plants that are enjoying the shelter. Moss. Hello, Neddy. There's a fern growing in the damp wood in the tree, but it's still fitting well. You can see where the uh, this other this sort of split trunk comes down and then goes up up there. So we can tell by the oh, little black buds. Are there any here? Yeah, just about here. These little black 
you gonna focus? No. Nope. Anyway, it's an ash tree. terrible ceiling light. I'm going to make some marmalade. Uh, now it's the time of year for Seville oranges which are the bitter oranges from Seville and um, so I've ordered some of these from Avon Cole, my veg box, but you, um, I also you can get them from sort of farm shops, supermarkets and stuff as well. So um, I've, I use a recipe from the Avon Cole website which I'll link down below um, and basically for a kilo of um, oranges, you have two lemons and um, four pints of water and then you kind of, a bit like when you're making a jam or jelly, you then sort of weigh out them, measure out the amount of liquid, i.e. juice, pulp, water, and then you sort of have the amount of sugar according to that. It's, it's a bit labour intensive but I love it, I really enjoy making marmalade and because it's seasonal you really have to kind of get in with the moment and um, I absolutely adore marmalade on sourdough toast so as far as I'm concerned this is a really lovely thing that I do at this time of year um, and um, it's great to get a whole sort of stock of marmalade ready for the year ahead so what I need to do is um, hello darling it's really really early you can't have your breakfast yet Sorry. So what I need to do is um, juice the lemons and the oranges and I've got a sieve here which is lined with some muslin oh, over a bowl and I put any pips and pith and sort of other bits like that in, into this um, sieve because it's the, it's the pips and the pith and this sort of um, this you know the sort of uh, segments, the, the sort of membranes around the mm. around the flesh, which provide the pectin to make it set. So you need to keep all that. Um, so we put that to, um, in a sieve with muslin. And I'm going to once it's finished, I will um, tie this up and pop it in um, with the rest of the oranges, so that the mm. when I boil up the skins, <coughs> the the pectin can come out of. Um, all the sort of gubbins and, and help the marmalade set. So once you've juiced them and put all the pips and stuff in there, you then need to slice the skins into shreds, which is a bit laborious, especially as I've got just over two, over two kilos of oranges there. But like I said, it's a nice thing to do, put on an audio book or a concert or something that you, you know, sort of something lengthy that you want to listen to. <laughs> and um, get chopping. So, uh, so I'm gonna get on and do that. I've got my um, sieve with some juice under there which I'll pour into the preserving pan and this is all the chopped peel uh, and there's a bit of juice under there as well so I'm going to add water to this now um, I need four pints for every kilo of oranges so I'm going to do about eight and a half pints of water into here and then I'll leave it to soak overnight. I'm going to tie this up with some string um, just so that um, this can go in because we need to boil this up with the peel on, after it's finished soaking in order to get all the pectin out of here. So I'll get on and do that. It's the next morning and I'm just simmering the peel. Now you can see this is right up 
um, to the top of the preserving pan so I won't be able to actually make the marmalade in this so I'll have to transfer some of it to another stock pot that I've got but this is just going to simmer now for about an hour and a half just to soften the peel I've, I had it on high heat I've now put it down to a medium just to keep it bubbling this is the bag with all the gubbins in it so I'm just going to give it an occasional prod and a stir over the next hour or hour, hour and a half, something like that, just till the peel is softened down a bit. Then I will measure out the liquid and add the appropriate amount of sugar. It smells amazing. Here's the softened peel and you can see I've removed the um, bag full of pips and stuff. I've given it a good squeeze with the back of a wooden spoon just to get all the pectin out. You'll see there's quite a lot of sort of gelatinous liquid that comes out of it and I've popped that back in here. So what I'm going to do now is measure out um, the, the, the juice and pulp and for every pint of liquid I need 500 grams of sugar. So I'm going to do that um, and, um, and then I'll pop this preserving pan back on the bowl. Now, like I said, I've got to decant some of this into a smaller pot. Um, so I will do that too. Obviously be really careful, this is kind of boiling hot liquid so um, we need to be a little bit mindful of that when we're measuring out but I'll get on and do that now. on quite a high heat, five and five, so it's almost at the top. Um, it's just starting to come up to the bubble now. You give it a little stir occasionally, just make sure though obviously you know it will be quite hot and syrupy and there's peel on the top which can cause a bit of a kind of skin if you're not careful. So just poke your spoon in quite carefully once it's up and running. You don't really want to stir it around too much but just do make sure it's not catching on the bottom. Um, so I'm going to, it does, it can take an hour at a strong boil for it to reach setting point. I've got my jars in here which I'll put on to um, sterilise shortly. Now you might be looking at this, considering I've got this and this and I've got this to do, you can see how pale it is when it doesn't have the sugar in it. I've got this lot to do and this is actually my second batch. So it might look like a ridiculous amount of marmalade and um, maybe it is, but I absolutely adore marmalade and um, you know you can only really make it at this time of year when the oranges are in season so I'm quite happy to give myself up to it. So I'll just leave these to bubble away and try for setting point in the next well probably 40 minutes something like that this is a lightweight um, aluminium stock pot so it's not as thick and heavy as the preserving pan so it does come up the boil more quickly but it does obviously mean you it, it could burn so just I've turned this one down a little bit so you need to be oh browse away <laughs> you need to be a little bit mindful if you're using a, um, a non preserving pan type of vessel to do your marmalade in um, because like I said although it gets the bowl a bit more quickly it, it can burn so just keep a bit of an eye on that. You can stir it around like I said just to stop it catching on the bottom but be, be very careful when you do that. So I just wait for this one to wake up and start bubbling. I don't use a jam thermometer and um, because I, I'm not really found them really particularly effective. Now you can sort of tell when it starts to get to setting point because you can see it's kind of quite syrupy and thick but it needs to kind of get to that gelatinous stage. This one's still got quite a way to go. You can see it's 
not yet got all kind of thick and treacly but if I just um, get a spoonful of the mixture here and what you can do is just leave it for like half a minute or so and you can see it's just starting to get a bit gloopy and gelatinous so not just thick and syrupy but kind of set so what I've got is a saucer in the freezer and what I'll do is just pop a teaspoonful of this onto the saucer so it chills really quickly and then I can see if it's getting near set. I like my um, marmalade quite a sort of soft set, so more like a kind of several orange conserve rather than like really thick and bouncy. So I need to kind of catch it right at the right moment. So, no it's not quite there but it's not far off either. See there's just little skin forming. A few more minutes and we're there. to give you a quick update on the chooks they're all still shut in because of bird flu um, and I've had to move a few of them around just um, after the initial kind of pa panic to get them to get them under cover um, so I have moved a few of them around so I'll just show you who's where and what's what this lot are still pretty much the same there's Ralph looking magnificent now he's finished molting um, and um, there's a butternut squash which they're resolutely disinterested in. There's peed on. Um, so yeah, these are these are the same configuration as they were before. Um, so and they're doing okay. You can see the the floor gets really manky, obviously because they're just in all the time. So I've got some wood chips coming because a friend just had some tree surgery done and they chipped chipped all the arisings so I'm going to have um, I'm gonna have some of those to put down in the run all right Ralph here's Nelson and his companion and again the grounds got really muddy so these are also going to be contenders for some oh, these will also be some contenders for the wood chip. They're just in their shelter overnight and obviously you can see although the gate closes securely making it fox proof 
um, they can obviously hop out and hop, hop off their perch and sort of go into the run whenever they're ready, which does mean that when we've had a fox here, I haven't seen it in the last few days actually, but um, it does mean that, you know, the fox can kind of razz them up and we'll just go round and round trying to sort of find a way in. I mean, he can't get in because those are sleepers, so he can't dig his way in and the, and the run is secure. But it just, um, I have been woken up a few times um, by hearing the, the chickens kick off because there's a fox in the garden. These two here are my special needs chickens. They've both got balance issues and the Rhode Island at the back is, is really quite um, disabled, but she's, she's doing okay. So they were in the um, big carport coop with the others, but she kept kind of getting stuck in places. And so I've put them in here and that's her friend, the, the buff Sussex next to her also seems to sort of fall over with quite alarming regularity. I don't quite know what's wrong with them, whether it's an ear issue or um, a brain issue or quite what, but anyway, they're kind of okay. It's just I need to keep them in here so I can make sure they don't either get stuck or get picked on or anything else. So yeah, they're doing okay. It's a nice big coop. So we've got a huge like dry area and it's um, it's quite a nice coop for them to be in. Right girls? These are the Well Summers and the, I'm really not sure whether uh, this cream leg bar here, the one directly in front of me, I'm not sure if he's a cockerel. If you look at him compared, or look at this one compared to the bird next to it. I mean, they are quite a lightweight hen. And I think it probably is a hen, just because you'll see I've got Tweedle there, who's a little barn velder bantam. And um, he wouldn't take kindly to having another cockerel, certainly not one this mature. So I'm assuming that um, it is a hen, but it does look rather alarmingly cockerel-esque. I don't actually know what a cream leg bar cockerel looks like, so I probably ought to look that up just to compare. But anyway, um, Tweedle, I had two, and they're called Tweedledum and Tweedledee, and I sold one of them, and I can't remember which one it was, so he's now just called Tweedle. Um, but he's in here because he was fighting with Jason in the carport coop, and so I popped him in here uh, with these ladies. These are really calm, these girls, and they just they don't seem to be fussed about being shut in, and they just kind of stand quietly and eat and peck around a bit. They're, they're just really easy hens. I'm hoping the cream leg bars will start to lay soon. They lay the beautiful kind of pale blue, green, khaki coloured eggs, Easter eggers. Um, and the well summers lay a beautiful, really, really dark brown egg. All right, guys. I put a shower curtain up just to kind of basically um, not just screen off the hens. I mean, obviously it doesn't make it that much darker, but it's more so that if the fox does come over, he can't just uh, peer in or try and get in at all. Um, so here we have the three light Sussex and the three other sort of retired hens and the two duckles. Um, again, I'm going to be putting some, some wood chip down in here. I'll kind of clean out the worst of the compacted muck and put in the wood chips. But they're doing okay. I might move Tweedledum or Tweedledee back in here now that uh, Jason's gone. Unfortunately, Jason got out. Well, he was in, he was in a fight with Tweedle. And then... Um, oh, she's still limping snowy there. So... Jason unfortunately got in a fight with Tweedle, which is why I ended up putting Tweedle in with the others. And Jason damaged his eye as part of that argy-bargy. And he did look really, really sorry for himself. I wasn't sure even if he was going to make it. But he did, but he was just, he couldn't see out of that eye, which meant he was quite compromised. And one morning when I was feeding them and had the door open, I ended up talking to my neighbour and Jason kind of got out 
and I thought, oh, I must come back and, um, you know, fetch him back in before, um, you know, he gets lost or something. And anyway, and then my um, my neighbour came around and said, oh, have you seen all those feathers? And unfortunately, the fox had got Jason. So it was a bit sad, but on the other hand, he was maybe nine, nine years old, I think, which is old for a, for a bird. And um, so, yeah, that was a bit sad, but not hugely surprising. You can see how they're all kind of just standing, looking a bit tucked up. Oh, can't really see over there. I'll get them some mealworms and just get them a bit more food. But it is really cold here at the moment, so... And it's a bit drafty in here, so they are... I've got a bit of a job trying to keep warm. Just brought Nelly out for a quick walk. Uh, it's a glorious day now. But I'm going to end the vlog here and um, I'll look forward to seeing you next time.